Hello, hello, Blackjack here, and today I'll be talking about Ruby's extended red versus blue reference, Juniper. Now, compared to the main cast, none of this team have quite as much to say. I say having made a 22 minute video about a girl that quite literally had nothing to say in her design. Still, I'll try to fit in the designs of the four members of Teen Juniper into this video, starting with their theme. While the members of Ruby were all based on fairy tales, Juniper is based on gender swap versions of cross-dressing semi-historical figures. That's, that's rather specific right there. Starting off, our Joan of Arc is John Arc. A lot of work went into that name. A little historical fact for you though, Joan of Arc disguised herself as a man to fight in a war before being burned at the stake. Fun fact, someone that was part of the trial and led to a conviction was Henry Beaufort, the Cardinal of Winchester. Less historical fact, Cardin's maze is said to have fire dust in it. You know, something that would be good for setting things on fire, such as a stake. Good thing he's been relegated to Chibi. Moving away from some crazy character inspiration, Jean's beta designs show that he was always the casually dressed but somewhat knight figure he ended up being, without too many changes. The sketch shows that he might have had a cape or a scarf early on, but it was quickly replaced by a straight hoodie. The final version of his costume looks to be a combination of the two you see right here, ditching the gray hoodie and vest along with his chaps. He also went from more basic shoes and normal looking boots to more modern sneakers. Also, his designs are kind of different for some reason. In the end, Jean has blue eyes, but the concepts show him with red and brown. Eyes and eye color are pretty important to Ruby's character designs. Ruby's silver eyes, Blake's cat-like yellow, and Yang's color changing violet and red especially. And why it says a focus on her scar, bringing attention to her eye. It's kind of interesting to see that, actually, well, a lot of Juniper ended up changing eye colors in between other betas and their final versions. Can't really tell you a reason why they'd be red or brown, but blue eyes and blonde hair is the classic combination, so I imagine that's why it was picked. His sword and shield combo also have a different look. The shield is much more defined, appearing as a full curved shield rather than the flatter, folding one, even if it still looks like it was meant to collapse. The sword itself also looks a little bigger as well, or at least a little weightier from the look of it. And before moving on, I would have liked to see Jean's Volume 4 outfit take a little bit more from these designs. A vest or chaps could have been kept and it would have had a little more variety, but maybe I'll get some new threads for Atlas, and I'd be down for seeing, say, a different hoodie or maybe bring the vest back. And I think I do know the reason why he kept the same clothes, pretty much, though that'll come a bit later. Either way, it's an upgraded version of his original outfit rather than a new one, which is a bit of a shame compared to the other girls. Moving on to Jean's base outfit, a lot of my thoughts are actually shared with Yang, oddly enough. Yang tells you a lot about herself and the world, and Jean does the same, albeit a bit more generally. None of the Ruby girls tell you that the world of Remnant is a very unique, anachronistic society. Jean is one of several characters to wear semi-medieval knight armor, but he also mixes it with the hoodie, jeans, double belts, and high tops. He also wears it casually, just everywhere, which is also just so remnant. It's another display of remnant's unique fashion and the focus on individuality. It's just a common thing to walk around in a half set of armor, judging from Jean and Cardin. Mixes modern fantasy and history to create the weird and distinct looks that reads the futuristic hunter society that Ruby revels in. And as for Jean himself, well, it shows that he's kind of a goober, and that he's not exactly a great hunter. Yeah, armor is a thing that people wear, but Jean only having a chest plate and shoulder pads can loosely clue you in that he's inexperienced. On one hand, he needs the extra defense because he's not a great fighter to start out. On the other, his inexperience tells him they'll be fine with just a chest plate and shoulder pads. The fact that he's wearing a hoodie underneath that also helps sell that. The direct comparison is again Carton. Though not quite full plate, he's almost completely armored while still accounting for dexterity and freedom of movement. He's armored but still able to run around, compared to Jean's less than stellar protection. And honestly, it's probably a bit of a reach, though the other part isn't. Jean is a goofy character that's a little in over his head, at least in volumes 1 through 3. This is, well, almost shown in three ways. Only one of these is actually clearly displayed, and even then not all the time. Much like Ruby, Jean's symbol isn't his own. 
I mentioned in my video on Ruby that she and Weiss were the only characters to have a shared symbol with somebody, but I didn't actually realize that John's was the same as well, and with some story implications that have brought on many a theory. Mr. Ark's symbol is... two arcs. If you were like me, you may have thought that the two moon-like shapes were references to his voice actor, Miles Luna, Luna meaning moon. With a little bit of research and a quick French lesson, Ark and Seal translates to Bow of Sky, aka a rainbow. Jean in French is yellow, and Dark is short for rainbow. Kinda crazy how that lines up with Joan of Arc as well. Anyway, the rainbows are specifically passed down by his father's side of the family. Again, like Ruby, Jean's goal is to be a true huntsman in the image of a relative, in this case his great-great-grandfather, the veteran of the Great War mentioned in the series. Jean is caught up in his history, which is even better reflected in how Crocy Amores doesn't have a gun component. It's outdated, and it's up to John to actually make it work in the new age. Oh, and that sword looks pretty similar to the one wielded by the statue in front of Beacon. You know, that one that John is staring at in the Volume 1 intro? Makes you think. Another design aspect that actually shows John's character was added in between Volumes 1 and 2, in a weird, subtle way. In addition to the straps on his arms being removed, Jean's shoes had his logo on it before Volume 2. It's hard to notice, but the two marks were on the bottom of his shoes, you can see in a couple of shots. In later volumes, however, they change, which actually manages to show Jean's growth and also his goofy personality traits. After realizing what being a huntsman entails, Jean writes left and right on the bottom of his shoes to help him figure out one which is which. While on the surface, that seems like a joke about how John is presented as kind of a moron, it's actually done in order to help him in the case of a concussion. In his words, should he take a heavy hit and forget his directions, he'd just need to check and remember which way is left and which way is right. That's actually pretty on brand for him. He's learning that he's going to be taking a lot of hits, and accounting for that possibility to account for his lack of skill. It's, it's also pretty goofy. The other way Jean's outfit shows the kind of person he is isn't actually revealed until volume 4, which does explain why he doesn't get a new hoodie. Kind of. It was actually somewhat spoiled a bit in advance by Grim Eclipse. Uh, some clever clipping lets you peek through Jean's armor to reveal his quote-unquote true emblem. A bunny. that's on brand. Jean is just a kid at heart that proudly wears the hoodie of featuring a serial mascot on his chest. That's the equivalent of, like, running around with Tony the Tiger on your shirt as you're wheeling around your giant sword. Once again, that just shows Remnant. The Huntsman-to-be carries a medieval sword and shield, upgraded to include futuristic collapsible technology, wearing a hoodie marked with a brand logo, and a pair of torn-up jeans. That's, that's Ruby for you. Sadly, while we finally get to see Pumpkin Pete's smiling face in Volume 4, it's quickly hidden by Jean's upgraded outfit. After... <laughs> Pira's armor and circlet were repurposed and styled into a new Crocia Moors, and Jean received a set of armor to match. Both his weapon and his gear now sport bronze accents, literally carrying the heart of his lost friend with him at all times. His armor is even stated to be heavier, lest that we forget a heart is heavy burden. Jean also now sports a red sash, taking up the mantle of Pyrrha, much like Ruby did this summer. Because never forget who we lose, and we keep moving forward. That comes up quite a lot. And aside from that, the only other noteworthy change is that he traded his gloves for proper gauntlets, matching his new chestplate. There's not much more to say about it other than that. Uh, while I do wish this outfit had a bit more variety from his last, it shows how far he's come, and how much his story has changed since Ruby saw Vomit Boy way back on the way to Beacon. Next on our list is Nora Valkyrie, based on Thor, who disguised himself as the goddess Freya to get his hammer back. Now, this is what I mean when I say that Juniper doesn't have quite a lot to say design-wise. Aside from being a very Ruby-esque design, it doesn't tell you much about her design philosophy in the same way that the other characters do. 
You can get a lot of Norse personality from outfit. It definitely reads as something worn by someone full of energy and emotion, and someone who doesn't shy away from most of her feelings, except for those totally platonic childhood friend feelings, uh, shown in her heart-shaped cleavage. Though, if you take away her magna hilt, her giant hammer, the only way she, you know she's Thor is because her emblem is a lightning hammer, based on Thor's Mjolnir. Jean at least has a little bit of story implications with his. In fact, I only really have two things to say of any real note aside from that. One is Nora's color. The wiki actually lists numerous theories as to what her color theme name is based on, Nora. One is that Nora is short for Eleanor, or the Arabic Nur, both meaning light. This, the more likely version is that she's named after Nora Barlow Columbine, a pink flower itself named after the granddaughter of Charles Darwin. Considering her color is displayed as pink, and it's a pink flower, that seems the more likely option. Oh, also the word Nora in Japanese apparently means stray. Fitting for an orphan. Man, a lot of, a lot of coincidences in these names. The other note I have is that in Volume 1, Nora had a long blue bow on the back of her skirt. It's pretty easy to miss, and it was removed in later seasons. I've gone over this before, but things like that don't really mix well in animation. Long trailing and loose objects are removed on Ruby and Yang especially in order to save on extra needless animation. Once again, sans necklace. Monty even mentioned the bow when choosing Velvet's battle gear, as one of her fan-created designs had it. Rigged, for example, these two long tails here. Uh, Nora, at one point, had a design similar where it's just her bow was enormous and she had two long tails, but I didn't want to encumber her movement. I'll put this on the no simply for it might be more complicated than it's worth. Nora's time skip outfit, I have even less to say. It's a direct one-to-one -one from her concept art, and gets rid of the things that made her original more unique and more Ruby-esque. In fact, it's basically a pared-down version, considering she just took off the interesting bits. She ditches her metal armor section and the red and blue areas, and replaces them with a leather jacket. Her skirt is much the same. Looking back at the concept art for original gear shows that, yeah, she's just not rocking layers. Heck, it might even be the same top and skirt. The top lap definitely looks the same, maybe a bit longer, and the skirt you can chalk up to the new engine. I suppose it would make sense for the orphan to not have too many outfits, but you wouldn't really expect her to have a leather jacket in that case either. This outfit also only has really two things worth mentioning in my opinion. It's not really a bad design, but it doesn't have much to say, which is kind of the whole purpose of these videos. One is a very simple understand metaphor. The heart-shaped cleavage on her top now has a slash through it. The loss of Pyrrha scarred her heart, leaving a hole where there wasn't one before. It's a pretty basic representation of what Pyrrha meant to Nora, and the loss of her is now present on her design. Again, not much really more to say other than that. The other note is that Nora only has one elbow sleeve on this outfit, which I bring up only because she had two before. A note about Pyrrha's design is that, while she had two elbow-length gloves, she had one bracer on her left arm, the same as Nora's single elbow sleeve. Now, it's a bit of a stretch to say that, as I went over asymmetry being a recurring element in Ruby designs before, but I'm just kind of fishing for things at this point. Neither of Nora's designs are bad, in fact they're very good. However, compared to the stories told by other characters, they fall a bit flat. I also think her second outfit is just generically plain, so I do hope we see a bit more character and story if she gets a new look in the next volume. Moving on, I'll commit a heresy and not go in team order. I have a bit more impactful things to say about Pyrrha than I do Ren, so I think it'll play a bit better if I save her for the end. Like Nor, Ren's outfits don't have much to say about him specifically, but they at least tell you about his origins. Looking at him, you know right away that he's wearing Asian-style clothing, mostly Chinese for his Mulan inspiration, but with some Japanese thrown in. Unlike other characters, he's usually referred to by his family name like in Asian cultures, and Ren is used for his initial rather than his first name, Li. And his name even uses Chinese and Japanese, Li being Chinese for ardent or vibrant or burning, and Ren being his color-sick name of the lotus flower. And Li Ren also means hunter. More fun with names. That does make the name of his weapon a bit weird, though. Cheating a bit, uh, Jean's is actually Roman, as opposed to his French origins. Crocia Mors meaning yellow death, said to be the weapon of Caesar. 
Nora's is the Nordic Magnahild, meaning strength, and Pyrrha's Greek Milo and Aquo. Speak and listen. Compare Ren's Stormflower. Really weird it doesn't have an Asian name, especially considering he's the one that kind of is the most in your face with his origin. He's one of the only characters that gets kind of a different looking face, having the more narrow eyes associated with um, Asian countries. Anyway, another weird thing about his weapon is that they actually came a bit later into to development than other characters. Looking at his beta design, we can see he almost wielded what may be a Dao, a Chinese broadsword, instead of his bladed pistols. We also see that Ren really ran with the Milan theme, as he looks androgynous, possibly even being a female in early drafts. He's wearing a feminine-style Chinese Cheongsam, and his hair is in a style in a bun, held in place by a pin, again associated with women. Cheongsams are usually associated with women, though male versions do exist. Even so, it's specifically in a more feminine style, indicating that Ren might have been designed as a woman. An interesting note about this is that when the cast of Genlock cosplayed as some Ruby characters, the gender-fluid Val was dressed as Ren. I see this as a reference to his androgynous origins, but maybe just a coincidence. In addition to potentially his entire gender, Ren's design was changed quite drastically as seen in the beta. Though it carries a similar look in Chinese influence, his outfit only really kept the colors, pink cuffs, white pants, and red inside of the hanging bits. Even his color name born pink hair streak was absent, with a gray fringe replacing it. The other thing I want to mention is the top piece. The shoulder appears to have a lotus emblem emblazoned on it. The two sections are also held together with knotted buttons, which the research I figured out are called panko. What makes this interesting is that this is one of the few parts carried over to his main design in his timeskip outfit. What makes this more interesting is the placement. Now, admittedly, I don't really know a whole lot about Chinese fashion, however I'll mention that the panko on the beta design goes straight down, while the ones on his main designs are both diagonal. Just based on some cursor research and examples on Google Images, I noticed something. Your standard female chunk sim panko knots traditionally go diagonally with a clear split between the two segments of the top, while the male design usually goes straight down, forming two direct halves. In the beta, where Ren looks very feminine, he is a male-style panko, whereas his main outfits have a more female-style panko and the clear diagonal split. I may be reading into this a bit much, again considering this was based on sight and assumption, but it makes me wonder if Ren's top was explicitly designed with that in mind. It'd be a bit subtler, subtler version of the androgynous look, if that's what they were going for. And aside from the more just basic Chinese influences, I can't say much more about his main outfits. They have cool swirly patterns, but they don't really seem to have too much to say. And there's not really a whole lot to say otherwise, period. Though I do think his second outfit is a dramatic improvement on his first, though, for... One main reason. Good lord, that hair. Oof. With that, we can move on to Pyrrha. Based on the group Achilles, who once disguised himself as a red-haired woman named Pyrrha, she's one of the few to have early sketches by Monty himself, rather than, or in addition to Ian Lee. Something interesting about Pyrrha is that she was one of the first things to be written in Ruby, period. In fact, her death was planned from the beginning, to the point where her death scene was scripted at least six years ago. Monty's wife, Sheena Duquette, along with Soulfire Photography, the people who did the femme Roman, who that became Neo, even cosplayed the scene, a full two and a half years before we saw Pyrrha fade away. You could even tell it's early because script changes and posing and things like that change in the interim, but the iconic of the scene was decided even way back then. So Pyrrha's character, story, and death were decided very early on, which is why I think her design is so strange. Aforementioned early design shows that her design was also conceptualized very early on, with the base look being near identical aside from a couple of details. Color choice aside, Pyrrha's beta is pretty similar to the final. Her belt was originally a metal band, her leg armor was a little different, bracer didn't really wrap around, minor stuff. Real difference is the hair. Rather than her, her iconic ponytail, her hair was down, and she was also lacking her iconic tiara. Even the original Lion Lee sketch, her hair was still down, though it more closely resembled the final shape. At this point, though, she was pretty locked in, as by the third sketch, it was, she was pretty much figured out completely. It does also reveal a neat, tail, a neat detail in that her shield could slot into the arrow design on a bracer for easier use. 
The use of bronze and leather bring to mind Greek philosophies, as does our phalanx combo with Milo, speak, and Aquo, listen. This fits well with their Greek origin, and to this day, I still see a lot of people referred to as the Spartan, much like Yang is referred to as the Brawler. Much like the Greek Spartans, Pyrrha is known for her amazing combat prowess. Which brings me to my thoughts on her design in regards to Pyrrha. The reason I mentioned Pyrrha's story being written and her design being chosen early on is that I don't really get why she looks the way that she does. Don't get me wrong, I honestly think Pyrrha is one of the best designs in Ruby, but aside from the Greek theming, I don't think it actually fits her character in the slightest. In the story, Pyrrha can be broadly character characterized by two things, her skill in battle and her inability to reveal her feelings. Both of the traits were decided pretty early on in her writing, with her death spelling the end of the carefree days at Beacon, the strongest dying and her relationship with Jean being built up to deepen the impact of her death and drive all the characters forward. I kind of had a similar thing with Ruby, though it ended up working out a bit better. Her design was made before her character was decided, but a lot of things, if you just twist a few things, her character design works really well for her character. Pyrrha, however, I feel not only fails to represent her traits, it tells you the wrong information about her. Objectively speaking, even though this is anime, uh, Pyrrha's outfit is terrible for battle, especially in the high-action, very vertical combat Ruby is known for. I would expect the Super Champ to wear something a bit more fit for combat, but no, Pyrrha goes into a battle wearing high heels, a miniskirt, and a strapless corset. Pyrrha is one of the taller members of the cast, standing in at around 5'10". However, she still feels the need to wear high heels, and not even wedges like Weiss. And while she does wear armor, she pretty much only has bulky leg wear combined with her heels. Sure, it's a fantasy world, so there's a line of suspension of disbelief, but there's not really a reason why she wouldn't wear boots, especially considering her character. It'd be more in line with her to wear something a bit more practical, especially when she's already pretty tall. Her miniskirt is also a bit out of character, I feel. In addition to for being probably one of the worst things to fight in, it's also way too sexy for her. Again, Pyrrha's odds with her feelings. She's lonely, shy, and it takes the world ending for her to admit to her feelings to the boy she likes. For what she has in confidence in her fighting ability, she lacks entirely in her confidence in her romantic life and pack even her social life. Everyone thinks she's out of their league, so why even bother coming up to her? Why then does she wear a tiny miniskirt that exposes her thighs, and with thigh-high armor as well, making herself to be even more attractive? It would make a lot more sense to cover her legs completely to mix with her armor, and it's out of her established character to expose her legs like that when she has problem with her feelings, interacting with other people, being seen as a normal person. Of course, I have the same problem with her corset. For one, it's a corset. You know, those things that are famous for making it hard to breathe while wearing one while also restricting one's movement. And in a world where Pyrrha is constantly flipping, ducking, and bouncing around an area without any straps on. In another series, Pyrrha might have a problem keeping her chest from popping out. And if the excuse is that it's a tight fit, it also doesn't really make her out to be a warrior, does it? Exposing her shoulders and arms also seems a bit irresponsible if you're going to bother with armor at all. Even her bracer, her guard, is on the arm where she usually has her shield to protect her. Yeah, it's cool that it has a groove, but you would think the extra defense would go on the arm that's normally exposed to combat, as opposed to the one that's hiding behind the wall. Pyrrha also just wears a ton of jewelry for someone that wishes to be a bit more humble. She doesn't like how people only think of her as the invincible champion, yet she wears a crown at all times. Her gorget necklace and armband don't do her any favors in making her look like a normal woman, rather than just someone that's prepared for combat. She looks deific, almost. It's only fitting that she gets a statue. Everything Pyrrha wears serves to elevate her in a way that I feel doesn't really align with her character. It's not good for realistic combat, presents her as a near legendary heroic figure, and emphasizes her body when at heart Pyrrha is shy and lonely at the top of the pedestal she wants to get down from. Even though Pyrrha's story was written so early and pieces of her character were known from day zero, her initial design doesn't present her personality very well. Again, I feel it says the opposite. That said, I can see a reason for why Pyrrha works, but in the context of another character. P 
Pyrrha's look is the look of a huntress, a classic huntress. In a similar vein to Yang, it presents a woman that is powerful, capable, legendary, attractive, though with a bit less focus on modernity. Hers is a lot more old-school looking. It highlights the classical idea of strength, but not the actual reality of it. It shows off the looks of an ideal huntress, in the same way every comic book heroine is drawn to look beautiful and curvy rather than athletic. It depicts a beautiful, untouchable savior capable of slaying monsters, what the people of Remnant want to think the huntress is. I said in my last video that huntsmen and huntresses are essentially superheroes. No design displays that more than Pyrrha's, though it's on the one character I would say that it fits less than anyone. It's something a hero would wear, just not the kind of hero Pyrrha is. Like I said, it's a brilliant design that does say something about Remnant, but it doesn't fit the character of Pyrrha. Above everyone, she would be the one to wear something with function over form, that hides her body in favor of protecting it, that pre presents her as something normal, not as a superhero. I feel as though Pyrrha could have actually been reworked a bit to have a more fitting design. Unfortunately for, well, you know why. But she never got a second design, which might have addressed my problems. And we only got the fitting of the conservative pajamas and grip clips as a bonus. There's plenty of Greek-inspired characters out there for reference, and I wouldn't say no to a proper Amazon-style outfit, with or without the topless angle. Maybe that would have gotten John's attention. And I kind of feel as though this may have been a controversial opinion on Pyrrha's design. I've never really encountered another one like it. Again, I do like her design, I just think it doesn't fit her specifically in the slightest. If, say, Yang were the same thing, I wouldn't have a problem with it because Yang's character is confident and sexy. And I'd be a bit more forgiving to the high heels and corset because they'd fit the character a bit more. In any case, that spiel brings me to the end of my analysis on Juniper. I do wish Nora and Ren had a bit more to say, but they took fantasy over direct inspiration. Though I did manage to squeeze a few extra minutes out of what essentially amounts to a few buttons. Join me next time for a quick roundup video, and assuming we'll get the looks of the Volume 7 outfits, I'll share my thoughts on those. And maybe I'll throw in a bit of extra characters just to pad it out a bit. Blackjack out.